I'd like to welcome a longtime steel pan enthusiast, an accomplished player, educator, composer, arranger, and author, the co-founder and president of the National Society of Steel Band Educators, Mr. Chris Teller. Chris, how are you feeling? Doing great, Harry. Thank you. Thanks um, for this opportunity to interact with you and your audience. Thank you. Chris, would it be an exaggeration to say you are the number one steel pan educator in the United States? Uh, that's That would be a great exaggeration, yeah. Well, you've written the comprehensive Bible on pan education in the USA, and you sit at the head of the leading organization of pan educators in the country. So I think you should take a bow. Oh, okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it, it's... Um, I, I'm... I'm just honored and, and blessed to have had the opportunity to to do both of those things. And, you know, both of those things have been made possible by virtue of my position here at Miami University, where I work. I am a tenured professor uh, at Miami, um, and I've been I've been a tenured professor or a tenure track professor since 2000. So it's it's been quite a long time. And. And uh, that that uh, job security and that the the wonderful opportunity to work in academia has has provided me really the opportunity to pursue um, research and creative activity in Pan, and it's it's been just an amazing opportunity. And I'm I'm very grateful to Miami, uh, to Miami University for supporting me personally, and to supporting the Steel Band since its its inception. We're we're celebrating 30 years this year. So the wow. Steel Band, uh, uh, I founded the Steel Band back in 1994 as a graduate student here. And uh, this is our 30th anniversary this year. And the entire time we've had the band here, the, the university and the students and my colleagues and the administration here at Miami have been tremendously supportive. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. That's really great news. So for those who don't know, the NSSBE is a nonprofit organization founded in 2016, dedicated to advancing steel band education in the United States. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is the only such organization probably in the world. Am I correct? Is there such an organization like in Europe or anything? You know, I, I'm not certain. Um, I know that there were in the past here in the States, there were a couple other um, organizations of this type, um, if we go back sort of about, uh, oh gosh, when I was a graduate student, when I came out here to Miami, there was an organization that was headed by, um, or at least partially headed by, or co-led by a gentleman named Mark Svelin. And Mark was a high school steel band director in Washington, Pennsylvania. And that's not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in southwestern PA, um, and uh, I wasn't aware of Mark's band until I became a student at West Virginia University and got into the pan in the first place. But um, uh, that that organization, I think, was called NASB, North American Steel Band uh or NAS, uh, NASBA, North American hmm. Steel Band Association, something like that. Um, and uh, that that lasted for a, a while, um, oh, probably ten or twelve years. And they used to they used to publish a newsletter uh, that I subscribed to at the time when I was a graduate student. And then and then uh, maybe about uh, maybe about ten or twelve years ago, there was another. Um, such organization that was um, that tried to get off the ground, and that was called like uh, something like the International Association of Pan, and uh, it it sort of uh, fizzled fairly quickly. So I think that uh, NSSBE might be the the only current organization that's active in America, but I'm not sure what's happening. Um, say like in Europe or South America. And, yeah. and of course in, in in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, they have Penn Trinbago and they have other uh organizations right. that are active down there, of course, that, that we all right, know. but it's not exclusively educational. 
It, that's correct. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, our when we um, when we got this organization started, we we had two overarching um, guidelines or themes that we were thinking about, and and one of those was education. So we we really see ourselves as a an organization that's geared toward teaching. Or um, now, of course, teaching happens not just in schools. You understand? Exactly. I mean, uh, so there are, I guess, maybe a not to limit it to teaching, but to band leading or band directing would be maybe a more comprehensive way of putting that. Right. Uh, that was one guideline that we were paying attention to. And then the other one was just keeping it here uh, in in the United States. And and that wasn't um, that was a conscious decision not to be exclusionary or anything like that, but rather to just give ourselves some kind of finite scope so that we weren't uh -huh. trying to be all things to all people. Got it. Got it. So who was whose brainchild was it anyway? The NSSB. <laughs> Uh, it kind of was mine. Um, I had to go look this up again to, to find out when this actually happened. But um, uh, our board of directors comprises three people, myself and uh, Tom Miller, who I know you know very well. Oh, yes. Uh, who um, lived in California for many years, but uh, lives in Denver, Colorado these days. And Dr. Brandon Haskett. And Brandon is in Michigan at Saginaw Valley State University. And I reached out to Brandon about 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, because he was doing research in pan education here in America as part of his, um, as part of his doctoral work and also part of just his um, work as a professor there. And he developed a directory of um, high school and collegiate steel bands in the United States. <laughs> and so I thought, I thought to myself, well, this has got to be a person that is interested in steel band and that is a kindred spirit with me. So I uh, didn't know Brandon at all, but I, I reached out to him via email and I said, uh, Hey, uh, you know, I've introduced myself and said that I was interested in starting some kind of society for steel band directors here in America. And so we we met, I just looked it up, we met on uh, January 4th, 2014, so just a little over 10 years ago, <laughs> at, uh, I don't remember the name, but some Mexican restaurant in Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was halfway between Michigan and Cincinnati, where I live, so we just kind of picked that spot as about a three, three and a half hour drive for the both of us, and we both drove to Toledo, and we met at this restaurant, and and we talked for a few hours, and uh, had some enchiladas or something like that, <laughs> and uh, that's that's how this all got started, uh, really, um, and uh, we we brought Tom on soon after that because. As you know, Tom is a, a very, very experienced um, performer, a composer, arranger, yeah. business owner, uh, and a wonderful educator. In fact, Tom, I've known Tom Miller for a long, long time. He was the first guest artist I ever had with my steel band uh, way back wow. in the in the in mid 1990s. So I've known him for a long, long time, and and he's a great friend. And uh, somebody that I trust uh, and respect very, very much. And so, um, and Brandon knew him as well. And so we wanted to have him involved from the get go. And then we we reached out to a number of other people. And a couple of years later, I think it was actually maybe in 2015, we had a a meeting in Indianapolis, Indiana, during. PASIC, which is the the Conference of the Percussive Arts Society. Right. It wasn't affiliated with PAS at all. We just, a lot of us, you know, in the pan world are percussionists. Right. Uh, we have come from a percussion background, so we knew that people would be available to gather if we had this meeting at that location. 
And uh, it was about maybe 10 or 12 folks from different parts of the country, different uh, teaching situations. You know, from the very beginning, Harry, we were trying to be careful and sensitive to um, having voices and representation from diverse perspectives across several different metrics. So, for example, we we knew that this society wouldn't succeed if it was a bunch of college professors all getting together and um, declaring it so. I mean, um, because most people here in America that are directing steel bands are not college professors. Um, right. Most of them are teaching in secondary schools. They're either in a high school or middle school situation. Right. Uh, and then, of course, there are community band leaders. There are people that are running nonprofits. There, are, of course, are, of course, there are diasporic communities uh, in you know all along the the coasts and and in big cities. Um, so you know there are people that are doing this in from various walks of life and and various um, backgrounds and experiences. And from the very get go, we tried to corral a number of those people so that we could, as we began this initiative, we could have opinions and ideas and thoughts from a lot of different folks. Uh, we kind of felt like in the past when things like this were tried, were tried, they were unsustainable because they were relying on just a very, very small group of people. And, you know, even today, our organization is all volunteers. No one's yeah. getting paid to do this. It's a nonprofit. We're just all volunteering our time. But, you know, if it's only two or three people volunteering, the burnout happens pretty quickly. Yes. Uh, so when you spread the work and the responsibility out among a broader number of people, not only do you share in that workload and that burden, but you also gain strength as an organization from having a number of people with different ideas and, you know, not any one or two or three or even four or five people are going to have all of the best ideas when you consider that America is such a huge nation. It's a gigantic <laughs> nation that has 340 million people or something like that and covers a, a gigantic geographic area. So, um, and, you know, that was that was also part of the reason why we wanted to start this organization in the first place. Um, that is to say that, you know, there's not a small number of people that are doing steel band in America, but a challenge yeah. for us is that we're very dispersed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in Ohio, for example, Ohio is one of the most steel band heavy states in our right in our country with maybe, I don't know, 30 steel bands or something. Wow. But uh, they're sort of in these pockets. So there are a bunch down here in the Cincinnati area, which yeah. is in the southwestern corner of the state. There are a bunch up in the Cleveland Akron area. There are a handful in the middle of the state, sort of around Columbus, Ohio. Um, wow. And then there are some, like in the Toledo, sort of in the northwestern corner. Hmm. But, you know, for me, for example, to go to Cleveland is a four and a half hour drive. I mean, it's not close. Wow. You know what I mean? It's not it's not yeah. right next door. So and even in these days with all the connectivity that we have with the with cell phones and the Internet and YouTube and, you know, Instagram and TikTok and X and everything that we have you know, we, we have the ability to be very connected, but the fact is, is that, you know, people who are teaching, especially people that are working as teachers are very, very busy people. Yes. They've got their own fish to fry in their yeah. own situations there. And so it's very difficult for them to be connected to even people in their own backyard, let alone somebody say who's in Arizona or California or Florida or Texas or something like that. Yeah. So we're, we're, we, we have been hopeful and our design has been from the very beginning that NSSBE can provide a a sense of community 
for all yeah. of us in America that are doing steel band, that uh, just just that just that one thing, just providing a sense of community and a sense of place, a okay. sense of belonging for people that are doing this. That was a that was a prime goal of ours at the outset. Great. Um, let's get some of your stated goals um, for the NSSBE. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I know one of those is to connect steel band educators by serving as a center or focal point for issues directly related to the quality of steel band education and foster excellence. Could you talk about those individual goals and uh, and um, how people could relate to those? Absolutely, uh, and I, and I would direct uh, I would direct everyone who's watching or who tunes into this later to definitely check out our our website, which is weteachpan.org, and uh, our mission statement and goals are are all there. Our mission, everything, everything leads back to our mission, and our mission statement is is brief and very simple, and that mission is to advance steel band education in the United States. <laughs> Um, speaking to the connectivity piece and the and the idea of sharing ideas, this is something that's very important, especially when you realize that there are so many people that are that are or who who will and they might not know it yet <laughs> do steel band uh, in their lives, but they don't come from a steel band background. Right. They might not even come from a percussion background. So let's take, for example, um, a case where somebody interviews for a job as a high school band choir or orchestra director. Let's just say band director. And uh, they get the job. And when they go to interview the job, the principal says, hey, by the way, we have we have a steel band here. Um, <laughs> and that's that's going to be part of your teaching load. It's a common story, isn't it? Do you know anything about that? And the person might say, no, I, I really don't. So, um, you know, for me, I was in a steel band in college at West Virginia University. So when I founded the band here at Miami University, I at least had some idea of what I was doing. I mean, I knew how to play pan myself. I knew about the orchestration. I knew of the various steel pan instruments. I knew a little bit about the repertoire. Um, I wasn't really a very good teacher yet because I was inexperienced, but at least I had been in a steel band. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wasn't completely in the dark or ignorant. Um, and of course, over 30 years, I've gotten a lot better. I would, <laughs> I hope, I would like to think I've gotten better at it over that span of time. But for somebody who gets thrust into a situation where they're in responsible for directing or leading a steel band, or maybe they want to start a steel band. I, we've met a lot of people like that too that just say maybe they're in the middle part of their career and they're looking for something interesting to do. They're looking for some way to kind of pep, pep their um, professional life up a little bit. Or, you know, they go to a conference, they maybe go to their state music education conference and they see a steel band there and they get they get bitten just like the rest of us did by the jumpy. <laughs> Jumbi uh, infects them, you know, and they say, wow, this is, this looks great. I would love to do this, but I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know the first thing about steel band. I don't know even what the instruments are called. I don't know how many instruments I need to buy to have a steel band. I don't know where to get music. Um, I don't know how to play the instruments. I don't even know how to hold the sticks. Um, for a long time, steel band and I can only speak to this in the United States, but I think the same is true wherever it has taken root, not only in the Caribbean, but also in Latin America, in Europe, in Japan, all mm -hmm. over the world. A lot of times steel band has has moved and migrated and developed by word of mouth and by um, the passing along and sharing of knowledge from one person to another or from one person to a group, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, music is still, as, as long as there are human beings on the earth, music 
and knowledge, both musical and non-musical, are going to be passed along this way. This is the way <laughs> human beings learn many, many things. But uh, in music education in the United States, we're accustomed to having professional societies that serve as clearing houses and also um, means for sharing information among practitioners. And that's what we're interested in doing uh, so that, you know, so that a person who's interested in steel band or again, who maybe have this sort of like uh, foisted upon them in their yes. teaching situation doesn't have to spend, you know, one, two, three, four, five years learning by osmosis or by experience yeah. or by having to go seek these things out, you know, in a haphazard way. Rather, they can go just like they can with other instruments. And in, in, in fact, when I, when I, I remember meeting with Brandon ten years ago and saying, you know, Brandon, look, every instrument that I can think of has a professional society. There's the International Trumpet Guild, there's the Double Reed Society, there's the College Band Directors National Association, there's American String Teachers Association, there's American Choral Directors Association, every, there's um, MTNA, Music Teachers National Association, which has a lot of pianists involved with it. Uh -huh. Every instrument has their own, and, and has had for years and years, if not decades their own society um, where people who are interested in that or people who do that, people who are practitioners and teachers in that discipline get together um, at conferences, get together via professional journals, via websites, um, and they share mm -hmm. best practices. They share their ideas. They share what has worked for them? Uh, what hasn't worked? What are their challenges? Right. So that we're not reinventing the wheel every time somebody wants to do this thing. Right. You know, you've answered a lot of the questions that I have here, I was going to ask you, which is very good. Um, you just had your annual conference in February at the McCollum High School in Austin. How did that go? Very well. Uh, that was our sixth annual conference. We've had a conference every year since 2017, no, 2018, 2018, but we missed 2020 due to COVID. In fact, we canceled our 2020 conference about two or three days before it was supposed oh, to boy. occur. Uh, we were gonna host it here in Cincinnati uh, at Walnut Hills High School and um, it was right when the pandemic was hitting. And so we, we canceled it. I mean, literally about two days before it was supposed to happen. And then in 2021, we had a virtual conference. Okay. But other than that, we've had an in-person conference since 2018. And uh, I would say that every year we have, we've had about between 45 and 60 attendees it's mm -hmm. kind of been around that that uh that mark which doesn't sound like a lot but when you think about you know the fact that there are about at least according to our directory there are about 800 steel bands in the united states and canada that we wow. know about uh, and of course, that number is fluctuating because, you know, new ones start every year and also some shut down every year for one reason or another. But you were saying there are over 800 steel bands in the United States. I'd have to go back and look at the directory again, but that's my recollection, or at least that's a ballpark number. Um, so that's about 5%, maybe 5 6% of the people, uh, which again is not a lot, but we feel like our organization is still... Um, fairly young, fairly <laughs> new, and we're we're trying to spread the word uh, as best we can, again, being all volunteer. Uh, I can't say that we have different folks attend every year, so our, our conference has been, the first couple of years I hosted it at, at Miami University, which is just north of Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, we've also had the conference, like you say, this year it was in Texas. 
Um, the year before that, it was in Iowa. Before that, we had it in South Carolina. Um, gosh, and where am I missing? I, I can't recall. Uh, uh, we had virtual the one year, so um, I feel like I'm leaving someone out. That's terrible, but we've moved it around to different parts of the country because, you know, there are different um, populations uh, yeah. wherever you go in the region, and we, we, we're we trying to, as we go, we're trying to sort of um, cater, you know what I mean, to yes. different regions so that it's, you know, easier maybe for people in the south or the midwest or um, things like that or the coast, you know, to to attend. So we, we've had a few people that have attended multiple years. Uh, in fact, we've mm -hmm. had a few people that have gone almost every year. Um, but just uh, this year, for example, I said, hey, hold up your hand this year if this is the first time you've ever been to the NSSB conference. And I would say um, almost half of the people that attended, this was their first time. Oh, wow. So we're hopeful that those folks, you know, down the road, as we continue, yeah. will will decide to come again at some point. So what was on the agenda for that conference? Well, uh, our format uh, typically has been that we open the concert on Friday with a performance. Uh -huh. uh, so this year, our performance on Friday night featured the Inside Out Steel Band, which is directed by C.J. Mengi. Right. And uh, CJ is based in Austin, Texas, and um, has been there for a number of years and is a really outstanding steel band educator. And uh, he also presented actually a clinic on the following day on Saturday during sort of our main day of clinics. Yeah. Uh, so that was our, so we typically try to open the conference with a performance on Friday night. So that way people use Friday for a travel day and then they get in and maybe grab a quick bite and they can come to an evening show. Mm -hmm. Those concerts are typically open to the public. So not only our conference attendees are there, but the public is there. And then on Saturday, we have a full day of clinics and performances and maybe panel discussions. Again, all geared toward some aspect of steel band education. So um, we've had clinics that range from, say, drum set playing or engine room uh, techniques, um, composing and arranging, um, how to, I don't know how else to say this, but how to how to lead a rehearsal, how to direct a band, yeah. right? So you know, we've we've had sort of like a a guinea pig band, or the attendees themselves get up and jump on the instruments, and uh, that's what CJ led us through. For example, in his clinic session this year, was you know how to take a group. How how would I teach a group of relative beginners a new piece of music? How would I expose them to a new arrangement? And he kind of right. walked us. We all got up and got on pans, and he sort of walked us through his method of how he does that and uh, how he approaches that process. Um, so it, it it's it's really terrific. A lot of it is hands on. So we're yeah. we're actually you know we're again jumping in on the instruments. Or if it's an engine room clinic, we're all on irons and congas and bells and scratchers and drum set and things like that to actually learn uh, if if we're not experienced in those things you know and, and a lot of people again aren't uh, or right. they they crave this information because they have to then go back to their program and they've got to teach their high school That's or right. middle school students or their community band members how to you know how to how to make an acceptable sound on the congas or right. what rhythm should i use if i'm playing uh, a salsa tune versus a calypso how do i know the difference right. between those two things and what's the technique involved very good. And um, when's your next conference? I know next year, when and where? Still to be determined. Uh, okay. But um, our conference, uh, our sort of um, sweet spot for timing has traditionally been either late February or early March. And so we'll probably stick to that, that to time frame. I see. And we chose that time frame because doesn't conflict with other things that are typically happening uh, conference-wise, yes, yes. you know? So, um, 
you know, like percussive art societies in the fall, typically in November. Um, we tried to stay away from the fall because also a lot of our folks are, are music educators. And so fall time is like marching band season and they're doing contests and travel and things yeah. like that. Um, a lot of state music ed conferences are in the winter, like January, February. So we were trying to stay out of that zone there um, and trying to avoid spring break too. So that kind of late February, right. early March has been a typical time frame for us. Location, uh, we are having a meeting of our leadership team actually just um, next week, which is our typical debrief after this year's conference and then talking right. about where we think we want to uh, go next year. So we'll we'll be deciding that fairly soon. And we usually announce that in the summertime. Good. Talking about debriefing, how do you assess your accomplishments or your advancements with the organization? You don't have an administrative staff, really. So when you have these debriefings, how do you assess Yeah, your great question. Well, uh, first of all, the leadership team and the conference committee are typically all there at the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, attending, but also doing work behind the scenes and in general, just observing and talking to the presenters, talking to our clinicians, uh, talking to our attendees. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, since the, since the conference is small, an advantage is that it sort of has a very mom and pop kind of feel. So, you know, yeah. it's not, it's not a very big, we're all sort of, we're all attending all the same sessions. It, it's very much unlike many conferences where you have multiple sessions happening at once. Yes. We just have one session at a time. So everybody's right. in the room all at the same time doing yeah. all the sessions. And so we're there attending all the sessions. We're, yeah. we're evaluating it at, as attendees ourselves. Forget and you. then we also do a survey. Um, we, we do an online, uh, like a form stack survey of, of all of the attendees so that they can provide feedback. We want to know, you know, um, what worked, what didn't work, how was the venue, how was the location, um, even things like was it easy to get here from the airport, uh, how was the hotel, things like that, so, just so that when we're yeah. choosing future locations, we can be sensitive to those concerns as well. Excellent. Now, most of your executives and committee members actually run hand programs at academic, academic institutions. Um, and I think they probably run community bands as well. All of yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so we've got people from in our leadership team. We have um, we have a conference committee. We have an education committee. We have a we have a professional journal called the Steel Times. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have a, like a communication and outreach committee and. Um, those committees all have a, a chair, but they also have members. So we've got on our leadership team about uh, close to 20 people. Yeah. And uh, those folks are, again, sort of dispersed all around the nation and in different teaching situations. Um, most of them are, I would say, though, most of them are teaching in... Um, public schools or universities. Uh, there uh -huh. are a few that are coming from a community background. Right. Um, but that definitely, I would say, is a, a minority for us. Yes. Chris, I haven't read your book, but uh, what are some of the ways uh, potential PAN programs can meet their needs for things like instruments, funding, teachers, meeting storage and performance space that kind of thing is that something you talk about in your book absolutely uh the book is really a primer for um i mean i wrote it in mind for the person that wants to start a steel band but is starting from square one so uh yeah. they, they need to know everything sort of um nuts and bolts of how to put a program together and how to get it off the ground so I all those you. things you mentioned uh um, where to get instruments, uh, what kind of instruments do they need, uh, how to teach those instruments, how to select repertoire appropriately, how to populate the ensemble, how to get people involved and how to assess their abilities uh, in terms of assigning them maybe to an instrument one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, basic technique on 
all of the instruments and things like that. So yeah, it, it really covers. It's about pretty comprehensive. It's a small book, yeah. So it doesn't go into great depth in any of those topics, but it sort of broadly covers all those depth, uh, all those topics, from a basic level up to kind of just getting you started. Yes, and I take it that served as the blueprint for the NSSBE in terms of your structure and your approach. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the things that I addressed in the book are things that we think about as a leadership team and and that people have told us when they so part of the survey that we do at the end of the conference one of the important questions we ask is what didn't you see at this year's conference that you'd like to see at next year's right what yeah. what topic didn't we cover that's really on your mind that you want to see and 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 we get feedback on that and we use that to help to help us to think about next year and even beyond, you know, what kind of topics we need to address to serve our members the best. Right. Um, but you, you, you ticked off sort of the usual suspects, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, um, it's just like any other musical enterprise, any other kind of ensemble. People need to know um, how to play the instruments. Well, they need to know what the instruments are, first of all, in the case right. of a steel band. I mean, you know, and again, that's that's something that's a little bit unlike other ensembles. So let me be more clear about what I mean. Anybody who is teaching in a school in America, if it's a public school, if it's a government school, yeah. so not a private school, but if you're teaching in a public school, you need to have a credential. Yeah. You're, you're not going to be hired by a public school unless you have a degree. That's right. And anybody who goes to music school to get a music degree is going to learn how to direct band, choir, and orchestra because that's what the music school teaches them. Yeah. So nobody who walks in to be a band director is going to have any mystifying sense about what band is <laughs> because... Okay. They've been educated about that. Yeah. Uh, and even if a band director gets tasked with teaching orchestra, even though that's not their expertise, let's say somebody is a band director and their main instrument is the trombone and they're not a string player, but they have taken classes in their education degree on string instruments. It's mandated for them to do that. So they might not be an expert in string instruments, but they've been exposed to it in their schooling. They've been exposed to all the instruments and they've been exposed to the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm a singer going through uh, a music degree, I've had at least some exposure to instruments. So that's not a complete mystery to me. But I might get into that school program and steel band is a complete mystery to me. I, I might know nothing yeah. about it whatsoever. So they need to know what what the instruments are. They need to know how to get them. They need to know how they need to be taken care of and maintained. Yeah. And they need to know how to play them. They need to know the correct techniques and approaches themselves so that they can then teach their students those appropriate techniques. Yeah. They need to know something about the drum set and all the engine room instruments like the congas and the iron and bells and shakers and everything that you might encounter in that section of the band. And they need to know something about repertoire. They need to know what steel bands do. Now, you know as well as I do, and, and uh, uh, probably a lot of people on this that are watching this podcast know that a great, a great thing about steel band is that it can play anything. Yes. We can play any kind of music on the pen. It's not limited to calypso and soca music. It can play anything. Um, but... If I'm a steel band director and I don't know Calypso and Soca and I don't know the music of Trinidad and Tobago, something is wrong. <laughs> uh, something is wrong there. I mean, we're, we, yeah. we can't do this art form justice unless we know that music. Yes. And really, unless we know something about where these instruments came from. And, and just to go back earlier, you know, you were mentioning our, our goals uh, and our mission statement of NSSBE, right. and and that is one of our goals. That's one of our yeah. explicitly stated goals, is to honor 
the culture and tradition of the pen, which stems back to Trinidad and Tobago. And yeah. that's terribly important for us. Um, and, yeah. you know, we were, and when we started this organization, we knew that, we knew that some people might be bothered about it. Uh, and, you know, standoffish or cautious, or yeah. if I were to paint it in a different way, even hostile um, to our organization because they might see it as, you know, just another sort of same old, same old, here comes, you know, a man with a white face from America that's trying to, you know, tell us what to do or to uh -huh. take take our culture and usurp it or yeah. use it for his or her own needs. But, you know, I, I hope that everybody watching this will, will know from our deepest heart, everyone in our organization is sensitive to this issue. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, everyone that's on the leadership team of our organization is a devotee of PAN. And you can't be a devotee, and I mean that word seriously, mm -hmm. no one is a devotee of PAN without being enamored with Trinbagonian culture. I mean, yeah. we all are huge fans. Yeah of the origin of the pan and the culture and the history. And a lot of us have been to Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to go and I took some of my students um, upon the invitation of my good friend, Liam Teague in 2016 to, to compete in Panorama with Silver Stars. And it was one of the greatest experiences in pan of my entire life to be able yeah. to after watching video upon video and video and listening to <laughs> panorama yeah. music for decades yeah. to be on that stage. I can't tell you. I mean, it was, I almost jumped out of my skin during semis. The first time I got to play on that stage, uh, I almost lost my mind. I mean, I was so <laughs> amped about wow. playing that kind of music in that venue where where it all happens um so we desperately want yeah. people from trinidad and tobago to know that that we are we have so much respect and so much admiration for steel band and for trinidad and tobago and and for the pioneers i mean yeah i've had at my university i've had well i went to west virginia university and that's where i met dr ellie minette yeah and uh in fact i don't he built my pan for me as a graduation present believe it or not wow i have an ellie minette invader lead that i that's the pan i play <laughs> and he he gave it to me. I paid $300 for that instrument to have it chromed. And, and that was it. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's priceless. I yeah. mean, it's an artifact that I can't place a value on. And, and my, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I was going to say my friendship with Ellie, which I think I could call it that, although it's hard, you know, for a 20 year old person to have a friendship with a 70 some year old <laughs> gentleman. Yeah. You know, we didn't have a lot in common in that way, but I was a huge um, admirer of his. I, I've ha I had him at my school several times. I've had Cliff Alexis as a guest at my school. I've had Liam at my school. I've had Ray Holman several times at my school. Yeah. Just a couple of years ago, I had Andre White as my guest. Um, you know, a lot of people up here in the States that are not in the diasporic communities that are not yeah. doing pen as a, as a reflection or a embodiment or a representation of their culture, 
nevertheless are connected to that culture by having yeah. those culture bearers come to us. So yeah. for instance, when I had Andre here just a couple years ago, when he was preparing to come out, I contacted him and I said, Andre, if you're agreeable to this, I would like for you to teach my band a piece the day before the concert by rote wow. that we're going to perform on the concert. Something easy that you think you can teach us in, in a couple hours. Because I said, I want my students to have the experience of learning the pen from you with no music. Now, yeah. we played Andre's sheet music, too. I mean, we played right. pieces that he had written down for us. And we, we mostly did that. But and of course, mostly what we do is play from written scores. Yeah. Um, in fact, I don't let people in my band unless they can read music. That's my only requirement. They have to be able to read. Yeah. If they can read music, they can be in. But he did that. He came up and he taught, give me the ting, you know, yes. Kitchener. <laughs> give me the ting, yeah. He taught us, cool. give me the ting, you know, yeah. that the doctor ordered me, right? He taught us that tune in like an hour and a half. <laughs> and we played it on the yeah. concert. And I told the audience, I said, hey, we're going to play this tune. You won't believe it. We learned it yesterday. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. And it was such a great experience for the students to do that and for the audience also to hear and to know that yeah. that it's possible to do that. And in fact, this is how it's done in many places in the world. They don't learn from scores. They don't do it That's that way. That's right. So, so, I got to make a couple of comments um, referring to what, you, what you've been saying. Number one, I know most of you guys have had association with Dr. Ellie Manette. And um, you guys, I, the ones that I know that have been associated with him, never, never hesitate to explain the origin of the instrument, its history. And um, I mean, I've I've been places where, I mean, it really, in the middle of a gig, they'll stop and explain the instrument to the audience and talk about the history. So I know, I know all Ellie Manette's disciples. That seems to be a thing with all of you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to know also, um, when you're talking about teachers who are just, they come into a classroom, they know nothing about Pan and then it's just thrown on them to teach. I actually happened to, um, I ran into one of those situations. Uh, this one lady in San Francisco, she has a whole pan program and she knows nothing. Right. So I did refer her to your website, which she appreciates. All right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> part of the pro I'll tell you something. There is so much interest in starting pan programs in the schools, but the biggest problem is no pan teachers. I get I get demands for, for that all the time, and they're reluctant to start the program because there are no teachers to teach it. And I get requests for teachers all the time. So these two points I wanted to make before I move on. So we're moving on in time here, so I want to touch on some other points. Um, you know, Harry, just to say quickly about that, that that's, that's a, a need that NSSB is trying to Phil, in the sense that we're hopeful that people will look at this discipline, this art form, and say, I can do that. You know, I mean, yeah. just like any enterprise, as long as I have the information and I have a place to go to affirm that information and to get constant renewal and constant upkeep with my skills and my knowledge and, and advancement, you know, as things yeah. move on down the road, then that. Then, then it's possible. So someone doesn't have to necessarily be from a steel band program in college, like like I had the great advantage of being, in order yeah. to succeed at it. You don't, you know, you can you can succeed coming to it even without that background. Yeah. Now I'm going to just touch on these some subjects. Uh, one of them is about the steel band programs and their positions within the music education departments of the universities. I know when they first started, they were not regarded as really serious. They were kind of low on the totem pole of 
programs in the music departments. Has that changed much? I believe it has. Um, although I will say that um, to my knowledge, most people in universities that are leading steel bands are not doing it as their main gig, like I am yeah. lucky to do. As far as I know, uh, only myself and Liam are the only people who are collegiate steel band directors who, for whom that's their primary responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, there may be others that I don't know of. Um, but what, so what I mean is, is that usually the case is that if it's a college professor directing the steel band, they're usually the percussion teacher. Yeah. Or maybe it's a graduate student. So they're not, right. it's not their main gig. You know what I mean? They're doing it as an element of their program. Uh, so that's, that might be seen as a, a relative disadvantage as opposed to say a choir director in a college who's hired to direct choir. I mean, that's what their right. job is. You know what I mean? Or, a, or a band director or an orchestra director. Okay. Um, but no, I think that, uh, I think that these days, I don't think the steel band is facing that sort of barrier or uphill battle like it was in the 60s and 70s when it was first yeah. being introduced into the academy here in America. I, I don't think so. Okay. So I've got two, two more subjects I want to touch on. There's a lot of talk on the internet um, currently about standardization. Tell me, um, give me your position on that. Um, how would that facilitate your mission to advance steel pan education in the United States? Is that something? Do you mean standardization, standardization of, the, of the instruments? Of the instruments, yeah. 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 Um, I would, I'll answer it like this. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to travel fairly extensively in America, mm -hmm. uh, playing and, and working with bands from a lot of different states. And the instrumentation is becoming standardized in America by yeah. default, I would say. Yeah. So, for example, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, I play Invader lead invader tenor i can count the number of people that i know that play invader tenor on one hand <laughs> uh, it's i'm an oddball i'm a i'm a unicorn almost nobody plays it right and yeah. Garrell plays it matt Britton plays it tom uh tom plays it tom. gary gary gibson plays it by the way i want to add gary gibson i i've been watching your interviews and i know there's been a who do you who are you listening to right yes i you want know that's to, coming right <laughs> okay i'm gonna i'm preempting by saying i want to add gary gibson to people's list because the other list is the usual suspects right yes although i haven't i didn't listen to liam and Jaden yet yes but liam mentioned gary gibson gary is i uh, well i love his playing and for my money gary gibson is one of the best or i'll just say one of my favorite composer arrangers of steel band music going yeah. going right now he's an amazing arranger and composer and you know i haven't heard anybody i know that the, you haven't had many episodes quite yet but i haven't heard anybody mention Josanne francis yet or joy laps who we've had at our conferences the last uh not this year but uh yeah let's see Josanne two years ago joy last year yeah uh, those yeah, are. I think Liam those, mentioned that. Liam are, mentioned that to you. Those are some terrific band players right there. Yeah. So, anyway, um, wait. Now I got off track. What was the question again? Oh, standardization. Okay, yes. right. So, so in the United States, you could say the circle of fifths tenor is the standard. Yeah. And in fact, the low C circle of fifths tenor is yes. what everybody uses not the yeah. d not the d right. tenor. everyone exactly. 
not everyone, but 90, 95% of the people that I know that have a band have low C lead pins. Agreed. Um, most people I know have whole tone layout double seconds. The Manette whole tone yes. layout. I have in my band double tenors, the Bertie Marshall layout. But I have found that that is unusual. I've found that most people do not have that voice in their band. Instead, they just have a lot of seconds and they split the parts. Right. Um, in the guitar cello range, you know, of course, there are double guitars, there are triple guitars, there are four cellos, there are four pens. But most bands in America have triples. Yeah. Most of them are triples. Yeah. Um, although I was just talking to Tom recently and he likes the double guitar. The double guitar is very rare up here, though. Almost nobody yeah. has double guitars in America. Wow. In Trinidad and Tobago, I think the double guitar is fairly common. But up yeah. here, um, I've seen the double guitar in Alaska, and I've seen it at Tom's. Those are the only two places I know, uh, that I personally know that have it. Okay. Um, basses, uh, almost everyone here uses six basses. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the bottom note, the lowest note, sometimes is B flat. Sometimes it's C. C so it either yeah. goes C to F or B flat, E flat, right? Okay. But, I mean, uh, up here, what I'm saying, in America, it kind of is standardized. And it's really due to no one's action. Right. It's just happening that way. Cool, cool. So, um, one other subject um, before we close out. Panorama. Panorama Festival is really growing in popularity, uh, not just the big national panorama in Trinidad, but we have, you know, just about on every Caribbean island. And then there's Brooklyn, London, Toronto, French panorama, Japan. And these festivals are growing and they're not connected to each other in any way. Um, do you, is this a vehicle? that you see as being viable for pan education in the United States. Uh, if there was a national panorama in the United States, how different would it be from the others, which are basically based on competition? That's a that's an outstanding question. Um, I, I guess I'll say first that the idea of competing musically in America is not unusual. Yeah. Uh, we have um, DCI, Drum Corps International. We have WGI, Winter Guard International. These are, these are organizations that sponsor competitions in the marching arts. So think marching band or indoor drum lines and things like that. Uh, those organizations have been around for in the case of DCI, I think since the seventies, I mean, so these are, these are organizations that have a long track record and a long history. There are, um, uh, choral competitions for not only choral ensembles, but show choirs, you know, that involve dance moves and things right. like that. Um, School programs here in America, school bands, orchestras, and choirs go to state-sponsored, state music education, society-sponsored contests every year. So the idea of being adjudicated musically is yeah. perfectly baked into the DNA of American music. There's no strangeness there. Um, so I wouldn't find it odd to have at some point down the road, a steel band. Well, in fact, actually, there are there are some. Um, it is possible to take your steel band to state music education contests and get adjudicated and get rated. Mm -hmm. uh, that that does happen uh, here in the states. Okay, but, I, but I'm talking about if there were like, say, a a statewide or a nationwide contest for pan, right. I wouldn't think that would be 
odd or strange. That would be perfectly comfortable in a, in America. Um, and of course, like like the contest that exists now, there are you could find pros and cons to that, just in the same way that people have debated ever since the 60s, the pros and cons of Panorama in Port of Spain. I mean, like, right. there are plus sides to it that people can find, and there are downsides yeah. to it that people can find. Um, and I think that reasonable people can see both the pluses and the minuses to that right. kind of musical endeavor. So um, I wouldn't think it would be strange at all to have something like that. I don't, I'm not sure what form it would take. Right. Um, and I wasn't... And now I um, I haven't been, I've only been to Trinidad Panorama. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been to London or Brooklyn or Toronto or yeah. anything like that. Of course, I know about them and I I know yeah. that they exist and I've seen videos and all that. And yeah. but I've never been to it personally myself. But yeah. my understanding, and you can correct me because you know better than I. But my understanding is that those. Like, I, I know you just had Duvon on, for example. So right. my understanding, for instance, of Brooklyn Panorama is that it's very similar to Trinidad and Tobago Panorama. It just happens to occur in Brooklyn. Yes. So it's community-based organizations that are learning a tune, a popular song that's arranged by, in most cases, a, an arranger from Trinidad and Tobago. Right. Not right. a New York person. I mean, not a right. not an American. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's people from that diasporic community that are getting together in bands and learning that arrangement and competing with it. Yes. If there were a contest that would occur, um, whether NSSBE would be involved with it or not, if it were to occur in an environment that were, um, outside or disconnected from or not i don't mean disconnected in terms of avoidance i just mean not affiliated with a right. a diasporic community then i could see that contest being different in the sense that um it might not have the same connection to the literature or the repertoire right so i'm thinking back for example to like the old pen is beautiful contest which doesn't which hasn't happened for years and years and years but that was a contest that was focused on arrangements of Western art music, right? Yeah. Um, and they had a test piece, I think, that right everybody had to play. So, I mean, in other words, the parameter, even though it was a contest that was held in TNT, the parameters yeah. were completely different than different. I mean, the 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 way the contest was set up was yeah entirely different. So, um, I can't predict what kind of format that might take, but yeah. I don't think it would be a bad thing necessarily yeah. to have something like that. Something to think about. <laughs> something for NSSB to chew on in the years yes. to come. Sure. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing information on that selfless work that you and your associates are doing to promote pan education in the United States. Um, so I will list the website down in the description so people can know where to find you. And I uh, just want to thank you again for agreeing to come on the show. And um, I hope we can do it in the future when something comes up and you're trending again. Would love to. And uh, Harry, thanks for this. This has been a tremendous opportunity. And I, I know that there are going to be people that that we will reach in your audience that might uh, not be familiar with what we're doing. And I, I hope I hope we do reach a lot of folks. And right. thanks for including the website. And uh, thank you for inviting me to to talk about it. It's been really a great pleasure to do that thank you okay okay enjoy Bye -bye. the rest of the day uh-huh okay the pan players podcast is brought to you courtesy of kakesa pan emporium where you'll find still pan products you never knew you needed check it out at kakesa.com thanks for tuning in don't forget to like comment share and subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you get notified when the next video is released. Until then, kute chao.